I'm Sarah Worthington, and uh, I'd like first to add to the faculty welcome to all of you to this marvellous afternoon. It really has been um, something quite fantastic. Now, I know you're all here to listen to these three people, not to me, uh, but I want to say three things before we start. Um, first of all, the first two panels that we've had, um, all women, so not a great diversity on that front, but actually <laughs> what stood out was how diverse they were in personality and ways of engaging and their attitude to their jobs and the world. And I think that's something to take away, that we're enriched by our differences. And my association with Cambridge hasn't been as long as most of the people who spoke to you. Uh, I arrived here in 2011. Uh, and perhaps as a newcomer, I can see with um, much greater energy and enthusiasm the miracle of it all. So this is your Cambridge family. Make the most of it. So that was, is my first message. Secondly, this final panel is in some senses more of the same. Three more marvellous Cambridge <laughs> women. Um, uh, I suppose the difference is that um, at least two of these women really, really don't need any introduction. I mean, if you don't realise that we have a Supreme Court and that they've been working during their recess with Lady Hale as the top judge uh, and Lady Arden as one of the three female judges, then I am not sure where you'd be. Um, so uh, I would like to add my welcome to them. I know this is uh, what you've all come for. But thirdly, Eilish Ferron. Uh, I did meet Eilish in, in the mm, early 1990s, uh, where she was a reasonably young academic. So she is a Cambridge student, then a young academic, then a professor, then chair of the faculty, and now Pro Vice Chancellor for Institutional and International Relations. I'm not quite sure what else is left to run in the university, uh, but she does it with great intelligence and grace and elegance and I'm going to leave you in her hands. Thank you all. Well, it's my great honor to be here with these two amazing women. Um, you've had so many firsts in your life, your professional careers. I am not going to take up the time listing them all, but I want to perhaps begin with a new first. Please, will you be the first, the inaugural presidents of the Girly Swats Club? Yeah. <laughs> so, Brenda, you've said with your customary modesty that it was easy to be first in some ways because there were so few women who came before you. Uh, and Mary, you've made the point that uh, one of the things that was important at the start of your career, when people were not sure about you being a barrister, that there was a woman that you could look to as a role model. Now, things have moved on a bit since then, and we've talked about this already this afternoon. There are role models for us. Um, you know you really are a role model, you're an icon when you've become a character, the lead character in a children's book. <laughs> but if I may just for a moment reflect a little bit more personally, because I left Cambridge, I went to the city, I uh, went to the city in the mid-80s, the same law firm as Pippa, there was a woman partner, the first woman partner in the Magic City, the Magic Circle firm, um, around that time, there was there were a few others coming through. There was one notorious story that went around about the fem the woman partner at uh, Slaughter and May who dared to have a child, but she'd gone back to work two or three weeks after giving birth, and that was seen to be the standard of the time, uh, not making it easy for other women. But there was one woman whose name I kept coming up across time and time again, Mary Arden. If you were doing corporate law in the 1980s and 90s in the city of London, 
you needed Mary Arden. You didn't go to court very much because Mary Arden's opinion was what was going to give you the green light or not for your transaction. And I remember one transaction where the whole timetable had to be adjusted because Mary Arden was abroad. <laughs> <laughs> and so she came back and we were able to move on. So I just would love to know from both of you, maybe you, Mary, first, um, you know, when did you first know you were a role model? <laughs> and, and how did it, how do you feel being a role model? Um, is it something you welcome or a responsibility? How, how does it play out with you? Well, that's very kind of you to ask me that. Can I just say what I consider a role model to be? When I was growing up in the great city of Liverpool, there was a woman barrister who excelled, and her name was Rose Heilbronn. She was not only stunning to look at, but she was very effective. And the newspaper would, an evening, would come through the letterbox, because it had no newspapers then, and it dropped on the floor, and there was the headline, Rosie saves young man from gallows. And I, it was just part of the narrative that a woman could be a barrister. Now, she was very exceptional, and I don't think that I could possibly compare myself to her. But the fact she was there was truly important to us. Uh, and it became an assumption uh, that women could do the job. I, I heard a program on the radio a few weeks ago by Cherie Blair, and she was explaining that her mother actually used to go to court to listen to Rose Halborn, because there wasn't any television. So you might as well go down to the courts and listen to her. But she was very popular. Uh, uh, just turning um, briefly back to Eilish's question, the reason why I got pupillage, because being a barrister requires you to go for pupillage, and it was very difficult for women to get pupillage when I wanted it, was through a partner in the firm which, which Eilish worked. But it happened that the partner was the nephew of a very great friend of my father's who was prevailed upon uh, to uh, in ask uh, the set of chambers if they would take a pupil. And as my pupil master put it, when I became a judge at the uh, celebration that we have in court on those occasions, uh, he said, when your best solicitors tell you that you should take a pupil, you don't say no, whoever it is. <laughs> Uh, so that was my great good fortune, but things have moved on. Getting pupillage is a matter of merit these days and competition. But actually, to your question, how do I feel about being a role model? Well, I'm not uh, so sure that I feel it every day that that's the position. But what I would like to think is that people share my enthusiasm for the law and for finding out what the law is, for progressing the law, for promoting it, for making it uh, more suitable for every day. That's what I'd like people to go away with and to think, yes, I want to be a lawyer. Brenda. Well, you asked, when did I first realise mm. that I was a role model? I don't think I realised it until the Supreme Court came along. You know, I was just doing my job in the various many, many jobs. Um, I loved what we heard earlier about all the different jobs that you can do and not having lineal careers. I love the jungle gym thing. I'm going to use that, sorry. Mm. Um, but I was just doing each, each of these jobs and doing them as best I could. But the Supreme Court, one of the things about it is it's so much more visible than any other court. You know, anybody can walk in, anybody can watch on our being live streamed, Sometimes, occasionally, we're televised. So we are much more visible. And I think it was only then that I began to realize, yes, uh, people do see me as a, a role model. That's a very humbling and horrifying thing. <laughs> because, I mean, you sometimes get things wrong. You don't always do things the way that you want people to copy you. Uh, and so if you're a role model, maybe <laughs> people are going to copy you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> D don't wear brooches. <laughs> actually do wear brooches. <laughs> I have noticed that since Mary joined us, she's been wearing brooches. Yeah. <laughs> and I have asked her, please, 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 when I retire, will she keep up the good work? <laughs> uh, so uh, there are lots of things one could do. One hopes to uh, encourage, to um, 
Well, encourage and to warn. <laughs> Uh, young women, other people, you're going to come on to other people mm. as well, because I think the fact that there are women doing the job that Mary and I are doing is also an encouragement to other people who are not standard quadrangle to quadrangle to quadrangle boys, as I call them. If I could just follow, come up on something you said there, because it's actually really reassuring to know that you get things wrong. <laughs> And it would, I wonder if you would just say a little bit more about something that you got wrong. <laughs> oh. I hadn't quite finished the question. <laughs> you, that you got wrong at the time, mm. but then later felt, well, actually, I learned from that. It was good. Yes. I haven't thought very hard about the answer to that question. No, I'm sorry, I've just sprung that one. Yes, but OK, so every single dissenting judgment you obviously got wrong, mm. by definition. Um, but of course, quite a few of them I actually got right. <laughs> Eventually, yes, yes because uh, things move on and uh, your dissenting judgment is turned into law, usually by Parliament agreeing with your dissenting judgment and overturning the decision of your um, fellow justices or law lords or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, it's the times when I have not managed to persuade my colleagues of the correctness of my view of things that I think is, is the most troubling. Um, and the other thing that I think I sometimes get wrong is procrastination. And I think we all have to look at ourselves and ask, do we delay longer than we should in doing something about something? Whatever it is, whether it's a judgment, whether it's a, a, a problem of, of relationships at work or, or whatever, um, should one just let it stew? Should one go and do something about it? And I think that's one of the biggest problems of, of leadership um, and indeed collegiality. Uh, so I do beat myself up sometimes about not going along and saying, well, I don't like to go and lobby my colleagues. I think they should make their own minds up. But of course, I want to persuade them that my view is right. Um, <laughs> so it, th those are the sorts of difficult um, judgments mm. that I worry about a lot of the time. Can I just go back to the brooches for a moment? I know you all are. <laughs> but there's a serious point here. When I came to the bar, there was only one woman in Lincoln's Inn and she smoked a Sherlock Holmes pipe. So there was a tremendous pressure of conformity. And even now, I see it. And, and for many years, women uh, used to experiment with things like pinstripe trousers uh, at the bar. There is an enormous pressure on women to conform in their dress to the way men look. And I think this is part of the problem of us all, wear, uh, not Brenda, but myself, wearing suits. The, the amazing thing about Brenda is that she's completely broken with that. And she's wearing a brooch. You couldn't see a man ever wear a brooch. But this is a symbol to me that we don't have to conform, that we can be ourselves. So I think it's a really serious point. Mm. Yeah. And I had a, a, a question that I had given you advance sort of warning off. That it kind of follows on from that. Um, and it is actually prompted by uh, something that Gina Miller wrote in her book. Um, she said, you know, because she said, well, if I look smart, it makes me feel confident. And then other people's bigoted assumptions have less power to har harm me. So for women, um, you know, we, there's a bit of a conundrum there, in a sense, because we don't want to be judged on what we look like, what we choose to wear, how we present ourselves to the world. But yet at the same time, for a lot of women, doing exactly those things, choosing what you want to wear, presenting yourself in a way, taking advantage of the fact that perhaps there's more freedom in how women choose to dress to work and the like is something that they find the women find quite em empowering and i i would just love to know given that 
you know, for time in your career, you had to conform, but now you can be, be more expressive, if you like. Just how that idea of using what you were to give yourself confidence or not, whether that resonates with you and how you've dealt with that over the years. Well, I think it's a metaphor when Gina Miller says that. I think it's, you've got to find that thing which you can present as your uh, hallmark of what you can do, which is done in the be to the best of your ability. Uh, and of course, there are many things that no doubt many people can do, but uh, what would strike me is that, that idea about dress is really uh, throwing light on this problem that women generally lack confidence and they've got to have something to hold on to, uh, to with which to be able to go forward. I, I, I myself share that problem, but I like to think that if I have thought about a problem very hard and I've researched it very hard, that I then have something to show which will make me confident in dealing with the wider world. So uh, oh, well, the message I'd like to get across is lack of confidence is a huge problem for us women because we haven't got the history of people uh, of our sex doing the job for generation after generation. And I think we have to remember something that Marie Curie once said, nothing is to be feared, it is only to be understood. And she was a really great, high-achieving woman. Well, women have the luxury of choice mm. because we can choose what to wear much more than most professional men can. Um, I mean, I feel very sorry for my male colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> they all have to turn up in suits. I hate suits, um, as may be apparent. Um, and uh, they do all turn up in suits, with minor variations between them, <laughs> the style of their suits, but on the whole. So the only form of expression that they have got is their ties. Um, and sometimes the way they tie their ties, <laughs> <laughs> close watchers of um, a certain recently retired law lord uh, would um, <coughs> observe uh, that he doesn't know how to tie a tie. <laughs> And we have taken him to task on this, and he says, no, it's not deliberate, I just don't know how to tie a tie. <laughs> so, uh, but that's their only method of self-expression, whereas we do have the luxury of choice. But that makes life hard, doesn't it? Because what about all those bright city women lawyers and others who are told that they have to wear high heels? Now, no woman should have to wear high heels if she doesn't want to wear high heels. She might like not to have bunions when she's my age. <laughs> um, people ought to have a choice of footwear so that it is comfortable. And you can be completely smart and elegant and w without wearing high heels. And who are they wearing high heels for? <laughs> <laughs> you know why. Um, Women barristers did not have the choice of wearing trousers in court until the 90s. It was an extraordinary situation. I've had the luxury all my life, apart from the 10 years I was in the Royal Courts of Justice, when I could choose what to wear. And I, I was an academic and then a public servant. Um, and so I wasn't wearing uniform in court most of the time. Um, and so I was extremely fortunate. So uh, I would got into the habit of wearing what I found comfortable. Then I spent 10 years in the RCJ when I had to wear suits and robes in the, in the Court of Appeal. Then I went off to Parliament. And again, I could wear what I liked. Uh, and so that's the great luxury that I have had. And I would just say to women, I think, you have the luxury of choice. Be, of course, comfortable. Be tidy. Be clean. <laughs> uh, Look as good as you feel like looking, uh, and you should go far. Thank you. I was reminded as you were speaking of that period in the kind of early 2000s, the dot-com boom, 
when the law firms and others decided that a way of keeping their staff was to introduce a more relaxed dress code. And boy, did that really sort of confuse a lot of men. Um, <laughs> Those who turned up in something that looked like their kind of gardening clothes, <laughs> I think they were quite glad when they were able to conform back. Um, I'm going to leave the question of wigs, because I think that one could occupy us for some time. I'm going to move on a, a little bit. So um, just next month in Cambridge, um, the University Library will be uh, opening an exhibition, which they've called The Rising tide, which that's about looking at the progression of women at the University of Cambridge, um, unimaginable today that, you know, really that how recent it was that women were actually able to take degrees in this university. Um, we've moved on quite some distance. Uh, we still have a huge amount of work to do. Um, just to look at our uh, professors. Um, you know, we're still hovering in the mid-20s. Um, and Yvonne here again. I mean, I was a student here in the 1980s. Um, there were women in the faculty, some very wonderful women. I'm going to just mention one, and with apologies to the others. You know, it's Cherry Hopkins, who was uh, such an inspiration to so many of us. I don't think as a student, I was aware of the fact who was employed as a university lecturer or a college lecturer, but to think that it, even at that point in the early 80s, there weren't any women who were actually university employees is, is, is astounding. So it's good that we're celebrating the rising tide and everything we've heard this afternoon you know, indicating that there is also a rising tide in the profession, the entry level stats are good, but we're certainly nowhere near the high watermark. So my question to you is, how are we gonna get there? Well, for a start, uh, the important thing is to realize that, it is, that how important gender equality is. Nobody really thought it was important uh, until the turn of the millennium, I don't think. They, there was lip service paid to it by the powers that be, but they all thought trickle up would work. Uh, but I can remember going to a meeting organized by the uh, Association of Women Barristers, the Association of Women Solicitors. Um, I think we hadn't yet formed the UK Association of Women Judges, but it was in committee room 10 um, in the committee corridor in the Houses of Parliament, and the Lord Chief Justice, Lord Wolfe, was there. And Beverly McLachlan, the Chief Justice of Canada, came over, and she talked about the importance. She had four reasons, which I quote all the time, importance of having women in the judiciary and what a difference it had made in Canada and how they had managed it in Canada by a concerted effort between the politicians, the profession and the judiciary to bring all this about with public support. Uh, now, that speech, I think, changed the mind of the Lord Chief Justice of the time. And he began to realize that there was a problem and things needed to be done. Um, so things are being done, but progress is still rather slow. There are some encouraging things. There are reasons to be cheerful. There are reasons to be depressed. Um, Mary and I can talk about both of those things. Uh, <laughs> reasons to be cheerful. Um, uh, a recently retired uh, Supreme Court justice uh, predicted that it would take 50 years to get mm. uh, gender equality on the bench. Well, we did the sums. Um, and uh, uh, in the court's judiciary, because the tribunal judiciary is about 45% and has been for ages. But in the court's judiciary, um, it's been going up at an increase of 1.34% a year for the last seven years. And if it went on going up at that rate, it would take fewer than 14 years to get gender parity in the court's judiciary. So that's, quite, that's a reason to be cheerful. On the other hand, of course, we all know that there's much more parity the lower down the court system you go. 
So just as tribunals are much more even, the district bench is much more even, the circuit bench is less even. We're only a quarter in the High Court and the Court of Appeal and in the Supreme Court. With Mary's arrival, we went up to a quarter, but with my departure, we'll be going down again. Uh, so, um, and then you look at, well, what's happening amongst QCs? How many women QCs are there? Well, that is going up, but it's going up quite slowly, but it has gone up a lot in the last few years. So there are reasons to be cheerful. But then, as was mentioned earlier this afternoon, you had this really high profile case, can't think what it was called, <laughs> um, in the Supreme Court, televised all over the world. There were at least three women on the bench, but there were no women addressing us. Mm -hmm. And there were, I think, no women in row two either. I don't think there were any women juniors. We did do some sums. We looked at um, the appearances in the Supreme Court. Um, hang on, I've got to try and find it now, sitting on something. Um, yes, yes. 2009 to 10, first year of operation of the Supreme Court, women amounted to only 21% of the appearances before the court. I, uh, this is the barristers. While men, of course, were 79%. 2014 to 15, it was 20 and 80%. Uh, this last year, 2018 to 2019, it was 23 and 77. So it's not changed a lot over the last mm. 10 years. And most of those female appearances, sorry, women appearances, um, uh, were juniors. We actually, it's more difficult for us to do the, the sums about, you know, to ask ourselves, well, who was actually on their feet? Mm. Because uh, you can't always find that out. You know, um, even if it's a QC, they're not necessarily on their feet. You know, somebody like Karen Stain, for example, appeared loads of times in the Supreme Court, or quite a few times, but she was never on her feet, um, or at least only once. Uh, so my feeling is that those who are actually on their feet in the Supreme Court uh, are overwhelmingly men still. And of course, those are the people from whom they are really hoping to recruit the top judges. Um, I mean, they will let other people in, they'll let people like me in, but they really want to um, recruit from the top barristers. Uh, and so I do find that not a reason to be cheerful. So we've got some ups and some not so ups. Well, I'm a bit concerned about this notion of a rising tide because it suggests two things. Firstly, that the progress which is being made is a straight line. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it suggests that there's some external force, like the moon, which is causing <laughs> the backwards and forwards movement. I have heard it so many times said that the reason why there aren't more women in the judiciary, well, is women don't apply. That's usually one reason. And the other one is, well, it's the structure of the bar. And most judges come from the bar, at least at the high court and above. And so unless the bar does something about it, the judiciary can't be blamed for nothing happening. Actually, the real reasons why there was suddenly an upsurge in the appointment of women is that the penny dropped, that men suddenly appreciated uh, that there ought to be more women than there were, and there were then suddenly people who were prepared to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until there was that change of culture that the numbers significantly increased. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, and I would like to say this, that. Uh, it's, it's something which bears on this point that the judiciary thought it was nothing to do with them, is that uh, working practices have a huge amount to do with the number of women in the profession. Uh, and if I tell you what I think is the most important thing to happen, it is that there should be more flexibility mm -hmm. within the judiciary uh, and that there should be fewer rigid rules about when you can work and how you can work and so on. I would also like to see, somehow or other, mentoring, particularly for women who are coming back from having had a family and been out of work and therefore want to transition into full work and giving them the, uh, the eye-opening uh, perspectives that they might be able to do some judicial work or ultimately do some judicial work. Uh, and I'd like to think that those things would help them. And of course, I also think role models help. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to continue 
using the rising tide uh, theme, um, although I think that's a really important point, and I can see a uh, member of the university library nodding their head and perhaps <laughs> wanting to take that back in some way. Um, but I want to continue to use it to bring in another angle to this, um, using another sort of related sort of idea of the, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. So we may have a lot of work to do around gender equality, but how do we really sure that that, how do we really ensure that that also brings with it genuinely broad diversity within the profession? Um, Brenda and I looked at each other a moment ago when she used the word female, um, because actually I lead on equality and diversity for the university. And from the students, I'm increasingly being told that we should stop using the word female because it excludes those who cannot give birth, who regard themselves as women. And it is also limiting to describe ourselves by reference to the fact that we give birth or can give birth. Um, so how do we genuinely bring people with us in our gender equality quest. I'm also told in my university capacity that a lot of the work that we've been doing around gender equality, the Athena Swan program, which forces us to really look at our stats and challenge them. There's some research that says the beneficiaries of that Athena Swan work are white middle-class women. What about all the others? How do we ensure that gender equality doesn't become actually exclusionary in its impact. Brendan. Well, you know much more about that than I do. Well, I do. After all, you're, you're at the forefront of working on those issues. We are not. Uh, the, again, the good thing about working for gender equality is that it makes people think about equality generally, because the arguments for gender equality are very similar to the arguments for other sorts of equality and diversity. Uh, and so it makes people think about that as well and also begin to take that on board. So I would, our struggle is other people's struggle as well. Um, we all have to take the point about, oh dear, it's just like when women got the vote. It was the middle class women who got the vote. It was far too dangerous to let working class women have the vote. So uh, women got the vote in 1918 if they, if they had property or university degrees or their husbands had property. Now, how demeaning is that? Uh, but it was because they were afraid of working class, the, the tide of working class women. Then the women would have been the majority of the voters. Oh dear, I can't have that. Um, but of course, we've got to make sure it's not just privileged women who uh, are brought on by our campaign for equality. Now, I am fully aware that I have privileges which other people don't have. I was different for ages from my colleagues for a lot of reasons, <laughs> not just because I was a woman, but because I went to a state school. I was the only one who went to a state school when I um, arrived in the House of Lords. Um, I had not been in practice at the bar for any length of time. I'd made my career in other ways, the only one like that. I was the only one who'd, who'd um, uh, specialized in, in what Helena Kennedy calls poor folks law. The rest of them had all specialized in rich folks law. Um, and so I was different in a, a lot of different ways, but I was the same because I was white and because I had come to Cambridge. Mm. What a privilege that was. But when I came to Cambridge, I knew it was a privilege. I bet every woman in this room knew it was a privilege to be here. But I was surrounded by men who thought they were entitled to be here. And that's one of the things we still have to go on fighting against. The male sense of entitlement, sorry, can I say male? <laughs> <laughs> See, 
that's a real difficulty. Mm. Mm. The men, the masculine sense. Can we say masculine? Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm talking about because you've all encountered it. And there are far fewer women who have that sense that because I am who I am, where I've been educated, the family I come from, it was always that, um, I am entitled to be in Cambridge or somewhere else privileged. Um, we have to find ways of countering that. You have to find ways of countering that. You've got a much bigger role in all of this than either Mary or I have, but we can support you in what we say. <laughs> Mary. Well, I agree with absolutely everything that has been said. Uh, for me, equality is the idea of the age. It is the way in which we give dignity to what we do and the way we approach other people. Uh, it's a cast of mind, and that's what's changed in the 21st and 20th century. It's an extremely important idea. And I see diversity as meaning dignity for everybody, whether there are differences of gender or color or religion or means or whatever, uh, or, or ideas. So to me, it, the diversity you're talking about is simply a natural flow from what uh, you would regard as gender equality. Uh, and so um, I wish you well in your work. I'm sure it can be done. <laughs> Let's talk about the men. So the role of men in supporting this agenda, gender equality, race equality, pro genuinely uh, sort of broad diversity and inclusion of the cultures in which we all uh, sort of spend our working days. How do we ensure that we uh, bring the men into this and that they help us and work? How do we collaborate best with men to take the wording, <laughs> the recent Mary Edwards uh, work? Well, I wish I knew the answer to that. It would be very, very helpful to know. But <laughs> <laughs> the answer uh, may be that you just have to study the way they like to work and try and go with the grain a bit in the sense of getting them on side and to come with you. Uh, there's no point in treating them as enemies in the workplace. They're, well, they certainly aren't. Um, and my experience in the Court of Appeal, at least, where I was very much longer than I've been in the Supreme Court, was that you got to know your colleagues and you knew their strong points and their, and their weak points and you worked with the best points and you gave them the cases you knew that would bring the best points out of them and then you worked with them in a way which they liked uh, to be worked with. Some people like to work very clearly on their own, other people like to have be talked into a position and to talk about it more than others. I think you just have to try and put yourselves in their shoes. Do you agree with that, Brenda? Working with and putting people into their shoes or maybe... Well, <laughs> well I was interpreting your question slightly yeah. differently uh, because we all have to remember that we women would not have got anywhere if there hadn't been men who understood our situation and thought that if the world treated them the way the world treated women, they wouldn't like it. So they'd better change it. So let's say thank you to all those men who campaigned for women to get the vote, to become lawyers, to get degrees from this university. Absolutely. Yeah, um, because that's important. Uh, and another point to make is that feminism is believing in equality the equality of women and the validity of women's experience. That's how I define feminism. Men can be feminists too, and there are lots of them, and there are loads of women who aren't. And those are probably the people <laughs> that we most have to contend with, <laughs> rather than <laughs> because they are, in many ways, uh, the real problem, rather than men. But the other thing, of course, is the point that was made by several people earlier today, is that probably the most important thing uh, when you're making your way uh, as a woman in the law is to choose the right partners. <laughs> uh, and I have been extremely fortunate. I have been married twice, but both of my husbands 
supported me in my career. Um, my first husband, when I had, I only had one child, uh, I admire greatly Mary, who had had three. Uh, I only had one, and I know it gets exponentially more difficult the more you have. Uh, but he said, uh, when I said, well, I want to go back to work as soon as I can, he said, well, I, I wouldn't be expected to give up my work uh, because we have a child. I don't expect you to. So he was hugely supportive throughout. He also supported me when I became an assistant recorder, tap on shoulder, 1982, academic lawyer, long out of practice. Could you become an assistant recorder? He said, yes, of course you can. So uh, that. Um, second husband also supported me in becoming an assistant recorder <laughs> and has supported me ever since. So it is important to have the support of men generally and the support of uh, individual men. And the last point, there were 11 sitting on that case last week. We all worked together in a hugely collegiate way. The men were supporting us. We were supporting the men. Uh, it was a great example of collaboration for which I am hugely grateful, those eight men uh, who came with us on the journey. So, all three things. Could I just develop that a little bit further? So, thinking about the Supreme Court and the, the different people there and the gender balance and the like, do you think that when it comes to um, the characteristics that make a good judge or barrister, that gender matters? Hmm. Well, we talked about this a bit mm, in, in yeah. earlier panels, um, which I thought was because uh, people were asked whether being a woman helped. And I have always said, I'm sure it was a help in my career to be a woman at a time when people realized there needed to be at least one woman. <laughs> it was very often at least one woman. Uh, and so that, that was a help. But being a woman is also a help because you do bring different experience of life um, to the business of judging. There's just no doubt about that. And we had lots of examples of it talked about early, earlier on. Um, I was thinking about the immigration and asylum situation. Um, now, Mary and I were, she was in the Court of Appeal and I was in the House of Lords. Um, when we had the case of Fauna, about whether women who faced female genital mutilation in their um, country of origin uh, were faced a real risk of persecution, everybody agreed it was persecution, on account of their membership of a particular social group. And extraordinary intellectual contortions had been gone into by everybody else to say that being a woman who belonged to a tribe in this particular country which practiced female genital mutilation was not being a member of a particular, uh, a particular social group. How could you do that? How could you begin not to acknowledge that this was being membership of a particular social group? Mary found one in the Court of Appeal. Um, in fact, in the Supreme Court, uh, we all reached the same conclusion. <laughs> um, and I like to think that it was because they had a woman in the Supreme Court, or it was in the House of Lords, that they readily saw what, what the point was. So you can make a difference by being there. And I can give some other examples, um, possibly not as obvious as that one, uh, where being a woman does uh, make a, a difference. I'm sure it does, and I think it's... Uh, but also there are other types of experience that must be important, not just female experience back to the same problem as what we said before. So, yes. Um, there is a difference between being a good barrister and a good judge. Uh, Stephen Sedley said that the qualification for being a good barrister was reasoning to a given conclusion. It's obvious, isn't it? You get your client's story, business or whatever, you realize what your client wants, you realize what the best thing you can get for your client is, and then you work out a way of getting there. Judging should be the opposite of that. 
not reasoning from a given conclusion, but reasoning from principle and the evidence. Now, when you get to the conclusion that that reasoning leads you to, you've got to do a reality check because it might be absurd. Um, <laughs> or just you know, feel intuitively wrong. But that's where you should start. And that's where I have always tried to start, even though it, sometimes one does realize that one's view of the merits does, does some uh, uh, color one's judgment. But it's the opposite of the way you think when you're an advocate. Um, so the qualities you might need to be a good judge might not necessarily be necessarily be the same qualities that you need to be a good advocate, I think. Mary? Well, I entirely agree with that. And I would just like to say that I also agree that women have qualities which are uh, bring a great deal to judging. Uh, I could also give cases, apart mm. from fauna, mm. where I think that having a woman on the panel has made a real difference. Uh, it's not just a question of experience, so that is really important. It's also a question that women like to, to work consensually. This is, I don't know, I hope I'm not being stereotypical in saying that. But women like to bring everybody in, so it's a different form of leadership. Uh, but also, they tend to be rather, more, rather practical in what they try to do, and to produce a practical result and a practical so, a solution and, and method of reasoning, one that's really going to be helpful. And I think that those qualities really do add something to the overall result. So, of course, the message is, I hope lots of you will go away and think about it as a serious career. When I was uh, appointed, and it hadn't actually been announced, but I was walking down Middle Temple Lane, which is one of, one of the inns of court in London, uh, I was met by a judge coming the other way. And I said to him, he was in the Court of Appeal, I've just taken on the job. Do you think I've done the wrong thing? And the person I was speaking to was Lord Hoffman, as he became. And he said, no. He said, absolutely not. Because when you're counsel, you have to do what your client wants. But when you get onto the bench, you'll be able to do what you think is the right thing. And that's really ultimately very satisfying. And you keep on acquiring more knowledge and more skills. So there we are. I hope that's a good ad. That's good ad. <laughs> good ad. <laughs> are you, you happy to take questions? In the yeah. Room? yeah. I am very conscious of what an immense privilege I'm having sitting here with this opportunity to put questions to Brenda, Brendan Mary, but um, I feel that uh, this is such an amazing opportunity that we all have that I should at this point uh, open things out to, to, to you uh, for some questions or reflections or reactions to what you've heard. Um, they've graciously agreed to uh, take those questions. So um, I this oh, the, the, the hands on. went straight up. Okay, Well, I didn't mean to imply in any way that barristers can't change their spots, so to speak. <laughs> Terrible. Yep. You know, in other words, just as the, the story that Mary has told, you know, a very good barrister can become a very good judge. They can leap over. Uh, and I think the reason, uh, historically, of course, uh, barristers have been appointed judges because they were thought to be the top lawyers. There weren't legal academics, for example, until basically the 19th century. Very few. Um, nobody would have thought of appointing public servants as, um, uh, uh, as judges. So on the whole, the, the, the top lawyers were the barristers, and therefore they were the ones who became um, the judges. There's also, I think, probably the great British class system at work here. It's at work in so many ways. It still is. It's breaking down. But uh, you, uh, 
for so long, you know, my husband keeps calling himself a humble attorney. <laughs> He's not humble at all. <laughs> um, but that's what he always says. Um, because, you know, when I started at the bar, a, a lot of barristers looked down on solicitors. It was awful. It was embarrassing. You know, and we weren't, you know, they weren't allowed to have lunch together. We weren't allowed to do this, that, and the other. A lot of courts, when I started sitting, and I'm looking at a, <laughs> some fellow judges here, the circuit judge ate separately from the district judges. Now, the circuit judges were mostly barristers, and the district judges were mostly solicitors. But this hierarchy that there was in the law, and there still is to a certain extent, is really powerful. That doesn't happen anymore. Nobody gets any lunch, so... Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, they all have to take their own sandwiches in, so that's a good way of breaking down barriers. I sort of was, but I don't think that's why it was done. So it's all of those reasons. Basically, but don't think I'm not dissing the barrister judges one little bit. I'm just saying it's interesting. It is a different mindset. I'm going to take two questions, one here and one over here. Our comments. More of a follow up, really. There yeah. is another problem with solicitors applying to be judges because a friend of mine applied to do this. Mm. And actually, the admissions process is very much set up for barristers. Yes, it so is. It's yeah. very hard for perhaps even solicitors to take part time to afford to have yes. roles because they're so unsocial hours. You have to provide examples of your skeleton well that's that's absolutely true um, and I think that means um, an awful lot of pressure on the judicial appointments Commission um, to look at their selection methods I think they're reasonably aware of the difficulty but it's not always easy for them to address it and the tradition of you don't get a full-time job until you've done a part-time job is going to be very difficult to break down. Very difficult indeed for quite a lot of reasons because there are quite good things about that. Uh, about that. The same problem arises with, I mean, I've been banging on for quite some time that one way of diversifying the judiciary is to try and recruit public sector lawyers and private sector lawyers into the judiciary. And that is beginning to happen by a trickle because there's so many good, diverse people didn't stay in or even go into independent private practice. They've gone into the government legal service, the CPS, um, local government, um, magistrates court advisors, all of those sorts of roles, really good lawyers who often have got a mindset which is very neutral, very impartial. Um, you know, speaking truth to power is what government lawyers have to do. Um, and uh, advising members of the judiciary is what magistrates courts advisors have to do. So there are lots of pools we should fi fish in, uh, but it's difficult to fish in them, sometimes because of the professional constraints of those pools, you know, because the government legal service actually also operates, well, it's the the, the litigation bit of it operates on a very similar model to uh, solicitors' firms, and solicitors' firms don't make it easy for people to take part-time jobs. They should do, but and there's no reason why they shouldn't. You know, they can get, they could do it if they really wanted to. So we have to try and pressurise them. There's also in-house counsel in, um, uh, in in commercial firms. Why should they not become judges too? But do all of that. How do you assess whether they're going to be any good at it? And you have so you have to have good assessment tools, and that's really hard. Example of a skeleton argument, yeah. Um, well, why not uh, write a 10-page essay in support of a particular point of view on something, or an answer to a particular legal problem? Not a skeleton argument, but it's the same idea, and you could do it. But a skeleton argument is still arguing to a given conclusion, mm. which doesn't seem to me to be a good way of testing judicial <laughs> skills. Back to point one. <laughs> Question of hand. Sorry, I'm talking too much. Firstly, thank you both so much for giving us time today. It's been fantastic, and I will really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, ladies, hang on. You mentioned earlier that the former chief justice of the Canadian Supreme Court has yes. provided more reasons why it's important to have women in the judiciary. Do yeah. you think we need to share those reasons? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I do. I do use them often. I'm obviously I I domesticate them. You know I. 
Haley fired them or whatever. You know. uh, but the first is democratic legitimacy. The courts should be regarded as the people's courts. We're there to do justice for everybody. We shouldn't be, the people should be able to go to court and regard them as representing or reflecting society generally. Not representative in the way that parliamentarians are representative, but reflecting. Um, it shouldn't be a narrow elite group dictating to the rest of um, the society. So democratic legitimacy. Uh, linking into that, the values which the law is there to promote are justice, fairness, and equality. Equality is quite recent, but it's there now, firmly there. And so the bench should reflect those values of justice, fairness, and equality. The third reason was waste of talent. All those brilliant women who go into the law in the junior ranks, we've now got the majority, in fact, of, of law students who are women. Majority of people qualifying as solicitors are women, roughly half and half as barristers. Waste of talent if we don't get loads of them into the judiciary. And the fourth reason is the one we've been talking about. Sometimes your gender does make a difference. I think there are lots of ways in which it makes a difference. I mean, sometimes it's just your perception of what's the reality in a particular case. Sometimes it's just style, mm -hmm. um, you know, friendliness, <laughs> smiling. Um, it's not a bad thing. Um, but sometimes, uh, and this is a point that's been made by Kate O'Regan, who was on the Constitutional Court of um, uh, South Africa, your presence stops people saying certain things out loud, or if they do, you can call them out. Mm. And a lovely young woman I met at a, another event uh, earlier this year said, she was a student actually at a university that wasn't Oxford or Cambridge, but it was the next best thing. <laughs> and she said she was surrounded by the sort of hooray Henry type young men. And her technique was when they said something unthinkingly sexist or racist, which they often did, she would just smile sweetly and say, say that again. Mm. And they realized that they had said something unacceptable. So there are lots of ways in which our presence actually makes a difference. Thank you. Mary, would I you was like going to pick up on that point too, that I think, um, as I have experienced it, that the presence of women in any group, uh, one, they start to be there in a, in, a, in a sufficient mass, changes the behavior of the group completely. Uh, and that they then focus on the, on the um, point and it's a more, uh, a better exercise altogether, as well as taking into account a wider set of considerations. If I can just give a frivolous example. When I first arrived in the Court of Appeal, which was 2000, um, I had to know the cricket score by the time I went back at 10 to 2, and <laughs> because the only thing they would be talking about is the cricket. Yep. Or rugger. <laughs> yeah, I never got there. One of the things I'm really grateful to my husband for is that he got me interested in rugger. That meant when I was in the Court of Appeal, I could actually have a topic of conversation with my colleagues. So now we can talk about shopping if we feel like it. <laughs> I, 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 very, I know there are so many more questions. Happily, after the session and then the wrap up, uh, there is a drinks reception outside and Brenda and Mary are both staying for that. So there will be more opportunity to uh, sort of ask you questions. And I think there might be some selfies required. No, <laughs> many, no don't do selfies. Don't do many selfies. people in the room. Do, do um, photos, but not selfies. No yeah. selfies. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I asked that question. And I, um, have, to, I have to dash away briefly to go and sort of dump my bags in my room and then come back. So I might, I might not be at the reception for very long. Uh, Apologies. Can I just say that I really hope that you will go out of this and think it's right to celebrate because I think it is remarkable how much progress has been made in a hundred years. 
uh, and that we should feel positive about that. Mm. Uh, it's been very difficult for a large number of women. But then just think of Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire yes, sweeping yes. around the room. She had to do it backwards. <laughs> it's all right for the men. And uh, in and high heels. And in high <laughs> heels. <laughs> so on that, on that uh, word of celebration, which is, of course, absolutely right to come back to that at the end and say, I would like to close this part of the afternoon by celebrating the two of you. Oh, this, yeah. this university is immensely proud of you. I have to say we were immensely proud of the fact that there were seven Cambridge educated uh, members of the Supreme Court. We did, and this is a cheap shot, feel well. Oxford can have the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> So, well done. And I think I might even speak for the, not just for Cambridge, but for the country and saying we are so lucky to have you. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. <laughs> so Dave, I wanted just to say a few words at the end. Um, I, I mean, this has been such an amazing afternoon. There's so many things that came out, um, too much to think about. Um, I think that message of bringing your whole self, being authentic, was a sort of theme that ran across the entire afternoon. Um, and I want to thank all of our speakers for doing exactly that. I think the, the honesty and the openness and the genuineness of everybody who spoke here this afternoon was just palpable, um, and it's it's wonderful that you know we can have created that atmosphere in this room um, just by coming together in this way and the collegiality of it. And again, I think given everything that's going on out there in the world, just the civility um, and the sense of uh, being part of something together that was here was just so refreshing to see. And, and I think some people, personally, some people also reminded us um, of why everything that we've been talking about matters, not just for us in terms of gender issues, but, you know, to live in a country where uh, the rule of law does matter. Um, I want to sort of just think like people spoke very personally of their own personal experience of family um, in terms of when you genuinely are threatened. I mean, that really does bring it all home to us. Um, we had all women panels. Again, coming back to my uh, equality and diversity role, I mean, you know, these days, you're, if you see a, a single gender panel, you're supposed to kind of get up and walk out. Um, but that's all, male pa all men panels, and I think we can um, feel we've got plenty of, uh, plenty of way to go to even up that balance. The last thing I wanted just to do and say was to thank the organizers of this event. Um, and I think I can do so, not being self-interested because I'm actually mostly out of the law faculty at the moment, but I think we do need to pay tribute to the uh, law faculty for doing this, for bringing us together, for having this idea, for all of the hard work of so many people that went on behind the scenes and leading up to and today to, to make it the success it has been. Um, this is Brian's last working day or one more working day? One more working day as chair of the faculty. He will then hand over to Mark Elliott up at the, the back there. Mark, you've got um, a high bar to meet, um, not just sort of uh, the today, but Brian, I do want to take this opportunity to thank you publicly 
for being chair of the faculty this year. Um, everyone, you know, your leadership has been great. Um, like all of the administrators and everybody who supported this. And I want to thank all of you for, for coming because I think that sense of us all being here together and sharing something really important. Um, looking back, as Brian said at the beginning, you know, why we have an anniversary to our centenary to mark here, but also looking forward to what this wonderful institution, this law faculty, this university, um, more and more sort of led by its fantastic women is going to do um, on the launch of this uh, new sort of initiative within the faculty. So I think we're going to end by thanking and congratulating all of us. <laughs>
She's gone above and beyond the call with today's event, um, managing registrations, email circulations, and other logistical details too numerous to mention. Last but most certainly not least is Claire Gordon. Claire works with QDAR um, with her primary assignment being uh, the faculty's development associate. She's done a great job for us in that capacity in a challenging charitable environment. Uh, her involvement with this event stands out as I think it's fair to say her crowning achievement to date. Uh, she's played an instrumental role in bringing today's program together and I've heard a praise for um, among many aspects of it, but the, the diversity of the, of the people we've had speaking. And Claire has very much taken the lead in relation to that, done a wonderful job of thinking of people, of recruiting them, bringing, in, uh, bringing them in, and uh, in terms of the membership of the people who come and uh, talk today, that's all down to Claire. Indeed, it's no exaggeration to say that without Claire, this event would not have happened. Um, now, uh, what I've focused on with my remarks has been the past, present, and future. So we've talked about, I talked about the past, the introduction, I've just been talking about the present. I want to talk about the future. Um, today's event provides crystal clear evidence of the outstanding women who study law here in Cambridge. Now, we've been well aware of this at some level, but we have done too little to capitalize. <clears throat> so the, this event marks a turning point because what we're going to be doing moving forward is we are going to seek to capitalize fully on the wonderful women graduates um, from the Cambridge Law Faculty. And this is uh, the way in which we're making this concrete is by launching uh, Cambridge Women in Law. Now, what this is, is it's going to be a network of supporters for activities oriented around the careers of women, legal education, legal issues, and the practice of law. Um, and we've uh, taken this initial step by, again, um, please do sign up, whether it's old style or whether you do it through the website, because what we want you to do is we want to um, keep you up to date with the activity, activities of QUIL, Cambridge Women in Law. Um, I can give you a spoiler alert as to what is going to be the first news item, which is that we are going to, um, we're going to launch soon uh, the QUIL's advisory board. The board will be comprised of a number of faculty members and there will be a number of external members, more news soon. Um, I anticipate that one of the first items of business for the advisory board will be to consider how to fortify relations with the Cambridge University Society for Women Lawyers, or CUSL, um, which is a student-run society. Now, today's been a great event, but one element that has been not entirely absent, but not, a, not as full-on as it theoretically could have been, which would be students. And of course, students are why, as a faculty, we are here. Now, the reason for this, of course, is the timing, because we're before term has started. But as Quill moves forward, what it, it should be doing is working with CUSL, working together so that they can uh, organize events um, and uh, work together and have a harmonious relationship between, this, um, between Quill and CUSL so as to uh, fortify CUSL's operations and, in turn, Quill's as well. So that's going to be a crucial thing that uh, Quill will need to be doing going forward. Um, and the, uh, I guess I could, uh, what I would finish with is just, again, Eilish has already said, and we do all just, you know, it's been a great event. Congratulations. It's, I'm, and since people have gone more personal than you're used to seeing in an academic event, so I have spent a year as chair. It's been fascinating. Um, <laughs> and I would say that this indeed has been one of the, an achievement of which um, the faculty has been very proud, but personally, it's been very gratifying to be involved with this event. And I do hope that the faculty takes the opportunity that this event has provided in order to capitalize on this and to ensure that both students and graduates, Cambridge women, that they um, work together and work together with the faculty in what will be a wonderful joint enterprise. And everyone, I should stress, everyone is welcome to um, uh, keep going in relation to that journey. Now, I, as the final obstacle before the, um, before the reception, I'm finished. So that is upstairs, and I hope you'll all have an opportunity to discuss today's wonderful events. It's been, uh, it's been great, so thanks very much. <laughs>